<clears throat> well, friends, good morning and welcome to Rise and Shine, our daily Bible study time, uh, a Bible study that's intended to inspire you, to instruct you, and to impact your lives in ways that you never imagined possible. Every time that we open up God's Word, it speaks to us about who we are, but about especially who we can become. We are in, in a time of transition and a time of transformation, and so I hope that God's Word will speak to you today about who you are and about who you can become. We have dedicated our lives to imitate Jesus, to become more like we were created to be, um, to balance both what we need to do in our homes and in our work and in our lives with what we want to do, what we are called to do uh, by God. So we are looking through the Gospel of Matthew as Jesus reveals to us, uh, teaches us about what life is really all about, about our destiny, and about who we can become. Okay, so last week uh, we talked about how Jesus now in Matthew chapter um, 11, uh, it, the, the disciples are beginning to question this new Messiah I identity. Jesus comes with authority uh, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, uh, to calm the, the created order. And they have this idea that he's coming in the, in the power of King David to reestablish the glory of Israel. But now Jesus starts talking about how the disciples, how his followers will be persecuted for their faith, called before kings and, and before the governors, uh, persecuted. And this is beginning to cause some concern. And so in chapter 11, um, John the Baptist begins to question, are you really the one? This isn't what we had anticipated. And Jesus begins to talk about this tension that is in all of us uh, as children, um, wanting neither the dirge nor the dance, but wants what we want. It isn't that, that we're looking for one or the other. We just want whatever we want at the moment. Neither one will satisfy us because we are looking for our own way and not God's way. Okay, so now we come to chapter 12. And chapter 12 is a transition time in Matthew's gospel. And as we jump into it, I want you to begin to see why this is a transition time. Uh, up until this point, Jesus has been teaching, he's been preaching, he's been, uh, through Matthew's presentation, he is giving up, he's presenting his authority. Uh, both in, in the written word in terms of the Moses motif, this idea that he is the, the lawgiver, the new lawgiver, but also with the authority to make it a reality, with demonstrations of power and authority. And with that power and authority comes resistance. And so today we're going to be looking at the development of that resistance. Why are people resistant to what Jesus is doing? Um, I can see by the clock on the wall it is time for our prayer. As we gather each day, we want to pray for our church. Um, I hope that you're praying for your church. I can't imagine why you would not want to be praying for your church. And, and if you're not praying for your church, um, I'm going to ask you why you're not praying. Um, what, what, is, what is holding you back? So today we're praying for God's church, which is the body of Christ, um, for the reality of what Jesus is doing to be made known in our community and around the world. Would you join with me? In our daily prayer. Father, I pray that you will bring new life and blessings to Mount Pleasant far beyond anything that we could ask or imagine. Amen. So if you prayed that, I hope that you are also going to be looking for surprises today um, as God answers that prayer, as he brings uh, new blessings and new life in ways that we can never imagine. So they're not, they're outside of our normal expectation. Uh, what are you looking for? Uh, what are you hoping for? So today we're jumping in looking at Matthew chapter 12. Let's just jump right in. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some of the grains and eat them. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple desecrate the day and yet are innocent? I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, 
I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went to the synagogues, and a man with a shriveled hand was there, looking for reason to accuse Jesus. They asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And he said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take it hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out, and they plotted how they might kill Jesus. Now, aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place, and many followed him, and he healed all their sick, warning them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out, till he leads justice to victory. In his name the nations will put their hope. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he, will be, he is divided against himself. How then can this kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges." But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can rob the house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks." The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and the evil man brings out evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you the truth, that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word that they have spoken. For by your words you, have, you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Then some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a mirac miraculous sign from you. He said, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now one greater than Solomon is here. When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. When it rests, when it says, I will return to the house I left, when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and it takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and they live there. And the first condition of the man is worse than the, than the first. This is how it will be with this wicked generation. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. 
Someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my, bro my brother and my sister and my mother. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, so what, what transitions are you seeing in this passage that begin to, to portray what is about to unfold in the future? Well, the first thing that happens is Jesus and his disciples are going through and they are confronted because the disciples are pulling the heads of the stalks of wheat as they're going through as something to, to eat. Now, you know probably from your history that the Jews had all kinds of rules that we're not supposed to do work on the Sabbath. And so they had to go through to try and define what does that mean? Uh, what is, how do you define work? Well, even in that little passage, you find that, that the disciples are going through, they're, they're reaping, they're pulling the, the stalks, they're threshing, they're, they're separating the, the wheat from the chaff, they're winnowing, they're separating the wheat um, the, the chaff is being blown away, and then, of course, they're preparing uh, the wheat and they're eating it. And so they've violated several uh, Sabbath rules that, that have been created. You find the passage that Jesus refers to of David going in and eating the consecrated bread, or what was known as the showbread, that was placed before the, the altar of God. And it was placed there, but then after seven days it was replaced, and, and that bread was given to the priest as, as their allotment. And so we find in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 through 6, that David and his followers go in and they consume that. Um, and so Jesus is referring back to the activities of David. And so we get this sense even later on in verse 23, the people that are watching this saying, could this be the son of David? So they're, they're hearkening back to the golden age of what David could have been. But this is also at this point, right, clearly... Jesus is being confrontational. We find that the, the Pharisees are beginning to become very suspicious of Jesus' power and His authority. Um, it's beginning to, to impact their world. And so the biggest impact we find comes when He heals on the Sabbath. Now the question is, is up until this point, Jesus hasn't really gotten their attention. But now he is being, he's becoming much more confrontational. Jesus is becoming much more bold. Um, he knows that they are watching him. He knows that he's being watched. As a matter of fact, they bring this man to him to, say, to, to set him up. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Now, the interesting part is Jesus is not going to back away. He understands what they're trying to do. It, it tells us that he understands their heart and he prophesies against them. He hearkens back to the prophet Isaiah. Um, and so he, he becomes much more confrontational, um, but he does not water down or he does not lighten up the message that he is, that he is um, sharing. He begins to share what is essential. He recognizes that his words are essential for the people and he is not going to back down or have them watered down, even when it tells us that after they stretch out, he stretch out his hand and he is healed, that they then plot to kill him. And the question that we have to ask is, why is this the event that doesn't just say, we ought to throw this guy in jail or, or we need to argue with him or whatever, but we now need to do away with him. We now need to have him killed. Because essentially he is interfering with the power of their position, of, of their cultural standing in society. Because what Jesus is doing is the very thing that is confrontational to what they said that life was all about. That as priests, that they, can, they have the, the dominant place in the religious life of the people. And what Jesus is doing is he is going over that, is clearly Jesus is able to do good on the Sabbath which is counter to what they have been doing all along. Now, what Jesus does is he actually throws it back into their lap. They say, well, is it lawful to do this work on the Sabbath, to, to take the, the heads of wheat, um, to, to, to do the threshing and the winnowing, and to eat uh, the bread? 
And what Jesus says is he kind of goes back. He says, I tell you um, that they ate the bread that was for them, but the priest desecrate the day and yet are innocent. Because it's on the Sabbath that most people would go to the temple and they would offer their sacrifices, which means that it's the priests that have to go and prepare all, do the work of the sacrifice, take the the lamb or the animal, have it killed, have it sacrificed, lift it up into the altar, prepare the wood, the fire, and, and offer that sacrifice on behalf of the people. And so what Jesus is doing is saying, look at your own, your own involvement. You're doing work as well. If you're going to hold these people to that standard, you need to be held to that same standard. He then goes on even farther um, to, to elevate his position by saying, um, I'm even far greater than the prophet Jonah. If you remember, Jonah goes into a very hostile world, into the Ninevites. Ninevites were very violent people. As a matter of fact, some people have suggested that it was the Ninevites that um, invented the concept of crucifixion. Crucifixion is sort of social terrorism, um, to hang somebody up there so everybody can see them slowly and painfully die. It's to this world that Jonah is called, and Jonah is so afraid and so angry that he decides to go in another direction. But Jonah's preaching turns this whole city around, and they completely repent. And what Jesus is saying is there's one that is far greater than Jonah that is here. And yet, in this wicked generation, they will stand up against you because one far greater than Jonah is here, and yet you would not listen to it. In the same way, one that is far greater than Solomon in all his wisdom and glory is here. And so the queen of the south or the queen of Sheba will rise up against this generation because she came and saw and was amazed by Solomon and yet one is far greater and you would not repent. And in the final stanza, he comes to this understanding of what does it mean? Jesus is creating not just a biological family, not just a nation or a race, that we're, just, we're Jews by virtue of our parentage, but we are part of God's family through faith. Who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters, those that do the will of my Father? So for all of us Gentiles, for all of us through the generations, we are part of God's family by following Jesus, by imitating Jesus in all that we say and do. Well, friends, Jesus is beginning to stir the pot. He's beginning to get the attention of the powers that be, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those that care for the temple, and those for whom the temple and the religious life is their source of identity, their source of power and privilege. Jesus is undermining all of that. Um, and so you're, you're going to begin to see that um, the, the powers that, that are, the powers that be, are beginning to pay much more attention to who Jesus is. And he is not backing down, but he is becoming much more bold and much more uh, aware of what their needs are. Um, I pray that in our time together, you continue to understand that Jesus is bringing you a whole new perspective of what life is or what it can become. Whatever struggles that you are going through, I pray that you just bring them before Jesus and, and let Him uh, continue to minister to you and invite you. Because if we remember in chapter 11, Jesus comes to us and He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So I pray that this day will be a rest for you, a time of, of renewal and strength. I pray that in our time together, as we rise and shine in the midst of a very dark and tumultuous time, that the faith of Christ will continue to just shine through you into the lives of those around you. So, dear friends, as we leave today, I pray that the love of God the Father and the grace of God the Son and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit will rest upon you and give you peace. Until we gather next time, till tomorrow, as we start getting into the parables of Matthew, um, it's interesting, and I want you to think about why do the parables come at this point in Matthew's gospel. Um, I pray that God will bless you and watch over you. Until next time, see ya.